confession. And my confession is, I'm going to have the Bible in front of me, but I am at the age where I have to do this. So I just want you to know, I am using the Bible, but I had to transfer the Bible to paper that I can read. So I don't want you to think, where's the Bible? Because this is a Bible study. Well, it's right here, but I'm old and, and I'm vain. Is that better? Okay. All that hair is getting in the way. Okay. The other confession is when Michelle and I talked about me teaching and I prayed about it and I said yes, she didn't tell me the lesson at the beginning. I found out after. And I'm like, really? Trials and temptation? And I go before the Lord, really, God? Because I've had enough of that. I've had enough trials. And if and I don't know about you, but whenever we talk about trials, you ever start to get a little nervous, like there's going to be a trial coming up? Yeah, that was me. And it was a, a moment with God to say, please, I have had enough. I've had two years of it. Please, I have paid my dues. Followed by complete laughter because I was reminded of John uh, 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And that's what I had to put my trust in and that rest and just laugh at myself because, of course, of course there's going to be trials. We're not exempt from it. But take heart. He has overcome the world. So if you've been like me, a little nervous that we're talking about trials and who is one coming, well, probably at some point, but we know who is still in control. And we do not have to walk in fear and worry if a trial is coming, because one is coming at some point, but the Lord has already gone the way ahead of us. Nothing catches him off guard. So we have to continue to trust him. So I'm going to start um, back in verse 2, and I'm going to read, and I know we read that last week, but it's so connected to 9, 11, and 12 uh, that I think it's best to start back in verse 2, and I'm just going to read to verse 12 for now. So James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, and I will add sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen to that. Uh, so let's kind of break this down a little bit. Verse 2 is that reminder that we will face trials of many kinds. And I think James uses 9, 10, and 11 as kind of those examples of potential trials. And no doubt that he uses money because it's true today. Uh, as, a, as a therapist, I have seen couples for many, many years, and the top three, one of the top three issues that brings couples to therapy, that's right, it's finances, it's money. So no surprise that James, who is speaking to Christians, is addressing money. And so he starts in nine with, um, with poverty. And in our culture... We tend to see poverty as less than, lower at the end. And we really have kind of a, our, and when I say we, I am speaking generally because individually we will have different perspectives. 
so I'm speaking from an American culture, uh, tend to see um, them as a lowly. But God is say, saying, uh-uh. The, the world or the culture might see you as lowly, but you are exalted in Christ. And then he's going over here to the wealthy, saying, oh, you know, you may have this wealth, but it's really easy. It's really easy to rely on yourself when, when you have the money. And it's really easy to get caught up in that worry of, um, of gaining and I will even use the word maybe hoarding of things. And then we become self-reliant. And maybe the trial is kind of knocking you off that pedestal a little bit to say, you need to rely on me. But what he's saying to both is that it points to Jesus. Because regardless of where we are in that socioeconomic status, we can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are in fellowship with him. That's what I love about Ephesians 2.19 because it reminds us that we are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. And God is not up there going, how much did you make? How much did you make? Oh, okay, you can come in. No, you can't. How much did you give? I think would be more of what he's asking. Were we generous with what we have? Now, interestingly, if you do a lot of research, and research has shown this for, for quite a while. This isn't something new. Those who tend to make about 30000 or less tend to be more generous in giving. And those who make about 100000 or more tend to give less than 1%. So I think that's where James is coming from in the sense that is there anything wrong with having money? No. On either end, wherever we are on that, on that socioeconomic status, it's all about our attitude. Because really, is it ours to begin with? Does it belong to us? No, I think God is saying, what are you doing with what I've given you? So what are we doing with what God has given us to glorify him? I think that's kind of the heart of what he's saying, because he goes on in verse 11 to say, just like a spring flower, it's going to drop, it's going to fade, it's going to die. And not only will our money or our earthly treasures, but also the possessor of them, us, we will also die. So are you going to trust the Lord through this process, or are you going to try to do it all on your own? And so I think regardless of where we are, James is saying, rely on Jesus. He is the answer. He is the way. He is the provider. He is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord provides. He is sovereign. He sustains us. We can't do this on our own, no matter what we have or don't have. But it's really easy in our society to get caught up in one-upping. And unfortunately, I think our social media has encouraged that to where our focus then becomes on what can I get to be like X, Y, and Z. And our focus is off the Lord and forgetting that this doesn't even belong to us and it's not even going to heaven with us. It's just more things to dust or clean or wash. And I don't know about you, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> I just don't. <laughs> so the older I get, it seems like those things just don't matter anymore. And I wish I had that attitude when I was in my teens and early 20s and maybe even in my 30s um, to just not worry about those things because I can't take it with me anyway. And all the people I thought I was trying to impress, they don't remember who I am now, and I don't even remember who they are. So it doesn't matter. What matters is what am I leaving behind for people? Are they seeing the light of Jesus? Do they see him shining in me? Because ultimately that's what matters, not the money. But what I do have, am I generous in sharing? Now I'll tell you, my husband is fabulous in that area. He is a giver at heart. And he told me when we were dating, he goes, I may be an attorney, but I don't have money because I don't want it. I've seen what it's happened, to, what it's done to my colleagues, and I don't want to be like that. I told God I will do whatever he calls me to do, but I will be generous. So I have nothing because I like to give it away, and, the God, and God has always taken care of me. And I really wish I had that attitude because women tend to be a little bit more, I need a little bit more security. Is there money in the bank for a rainy day? What's retirement? And I was like, Lord, you're so funny. 
of course. Of course you would pair me up with someone who has a generous heart, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. I really wouldn't, because he truly loves helping people. And I love that about him, and I don't want him to change. Occasionally I've had to say, oh, yeah, let's rein it in a bit. <laughs> and, it, and occasionally he has to say, yeah, you need to loosen up a bit, because this isn't ours. And it is, that is right. And so we, he has paired, God has paired us well and complimented us. But we do have to remember, we need to be generous no matter what, because there's always somebody else who has it far worse than we do. Um, so it all goes back to our attitude with money. But I also want to, to remind you, and we're going to get into to this with verse 12, is that God never said this journey was going to be easy. But he did say the arrival would be worthwhile. And he has always promised that as believers, we have eternal hope, no matter our circumstances. And I think that's what we have to remember, because it's really easy sometimes to get caught up, no matter, again, no matter the money situation, on the stress and worry that, that we can forget that, wait a minute, I have eternal hope. I have everlasting life. What a gift, a far better gift than anything this earth can give us. And I love that, um, that I think James really does a good job of reminding us about eternal hope. So he talks to us about wisdom and trials. And he talks, we're going to talk about temptation in a moment. But all throughout, there's really a message of eternal hope. And I don't want you to forget that, even because it, it's easy when we're in the midst of a trial to forget. And so I'm going to, I'm going to repeat that a few times. So when we get to verse 12, again, I see that as eternal hope and that divine wisdom that's available for all believers, uh, he talks about the crown of life. And in the ancient world, there are four associations for the crown. And by the crown, I am not talking the Netflix series, just so you know. <laughs> I am talking about the, well, I will be talking about the crown, the crown that matters. But in the meantime, we have four crowns, and we can find this throughout scripture as well. Of the crown of flowers, so times of joy, weddings, feast, that would be one. The crown of royalty, or the mark of royalty, so the kings are those who are in high uh, authority. Then we have the crown of laurel leaves, the victor's crown, uh, the prized possession and, uh, for the athletes. And we see some of that in 2 Timothy 4, 8, but in a way that we know the everlasting crown. And then there's a crown that is a mark of dignity and honor. And in Proverbs 4, 9, it says, wisdom provides a crown of glory. So we have four. But guess what? We don't, we don't have to go he sit here and go, oh, well, which one? Well, which one is he talking about? It's all of them. All of them come into one, which is the crown of life. Um, so the Greek word, so just so you know, on the side note, uh, in this particular passage in verse 12, uh, the Greek word for crown is referring to the usual term of a wreath placed on the head of a victorious athlete. What James is stating is that as Christians, we have a joy that no one else has. And please understand, I'm going I'm to iterate what Michelle said last week and a little bit of what we talked about in our small group, is when we say joy, we're not talking happy. Okay, happy is a fleeting emotion, it, it is shallow. Because I don't know about you, the older I get, as much as I enjoy Mexican food, it makes me happy, a few minutes later it's not gonna make me happy. Okay, so that's not what joy means. Joy is treasure, joy is, is savoring, it's from deep within that can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're talking about when we talk joy. So it's not happy, it's joy. Um, we also know um, that we have victory through him. We have victory through him. So no matter what race you're running, it's not about an earthly crown. He already has the victory, and through him we have that victory. It's a victory that others cannot win because it's a victory that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. We could think about his crown of thrones, 
uh, of thorns that he bared for us, that he took on for us. So when he says victory, and when we're talking about victory, we mean victory like no other. We also have the joy, um, one of the crown, the crown of flowers is talking about weddings and feasts, that as Christians, we have a feast that's, that's never ending. And sometimes that's hard to remember when, time, when times are tight. But he, he is the bread of life, and he gives us living water. But as Christians, we can come together and enjoy a feast that never ends. And yes, praise God to that. We are blessed. We are blessed. But guess what? We still have trials, even as we wear that crown. But, but we have to think about that for us, as we meet these demands that can be difficult, we do so in the conquering power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot do it by ourselves. We were not created to do it by ourselves, but through his power. We have a new dignity because we are aware that God thought us worth the life and death of Jesus Christ. We have a new dignity because we are aware that God thought us worth the life and death of Jesus Christ. So what is this crown of life? What is the crown of righteousness? It's a new kind of living that through Jesus Christ, we entered into life more abundant. And John 10.10 10 reminds us of that. The thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. What is the rest of that? I see some of you mouthing it with me. I have come to give life and to the full, to abundance. That is what he has done for us. Let's not allow the thief to try to steal that, because he can as believers. It will feel like he can. And this may sound kind of funny coming from a counselor, but feelings are so overrated. <laughs> they really are. I promise I have empathy when I'm sitting in front of somebody. Um, <laughs> that, that's the blessing from the Lord to give me that empathy. But I also know there's a time when we have to have a reality check that our feelings lie. And the enemy will do his best to kind of weave in and get us to believe that our feelings are truth and they should be validated. And maybe there needs to be some validation for some healing to take place. But our feelings can lie. And we need to be mindful of that um, and trust the Lord. Because even when we don't feel it, it doesn't mean he's not hard at work for us. And to trust him through that process. First Peter 5.4 also reminds us that our crown of glory does not fade. It is not the crown put upon a queen or a princess, or a beauty pageant. It's not that kind of crown, thankfully. I don't know about you. Um, I remember the first beauty pageant I watched. It was Miss America, I guess, and it was in the 70s. And I'm like looking at all their gowns and picking out which one I think is the prettiest. And then somewhere after that, you know, it's something I didn't watch all the time. But then the next time I remember watching it, uh, I realized what the stats were. See, back then they had the height and weight Remember that? And then it, I didn't like that. And I just remember looking at my parents going, what? And they're like, we were waiting for this moment. We were waiting for this. And they said it delightfully, like, yes. Because they were reminding me, this is earthly. This is not how God views us. Our worth, our value, our beauty, our crown does not come because of world standards or society standards. It comes from Jesus Christ. So be mindful. You know, sometimes there's these little jokes about make sure your crown's good. No, I think we need to quit those kinds of jokes because it's all based on artificial lies Object, being objective, you know, we're objects to whatever culture says how we should look, think, talk, all of those things. And that is doing a disservice to what Christ is giving us. It's a crown of, of, of life. And what an honor to have that. And so how are we respecting that crown? 
And no offense to beauty pageants, because I realize mm, there may be somebody in here who has done that, and I mean no offense to that. My niece was in one. I almost brought her crown with me, but she didn't meet the, I guess what we would call a stereotype. She didn't think she would win, but she's quite articulate, and she did end up winning. And then, and now she, and then she was humiliated, because she's like, that's not my crown, because I know where my crown comes from, and it comes from God. But I did tell her, even with this earthly crown, you will shine his light. You have an opportunity that you wouldn't have otherwise to show others what it truly means to wear a crown that only comes from Christ. So again, we got to remember uh, where our attitude and where our crown comes from. But as I was reading this section, I was also rem reminded of John 3.16. And we all probably know this verse, so please say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is what James is reminding us, that when we stand the test of these trials, when we endure, how blessed we are. Because we come before the Lord in our, with a crown of righteousness, a crown of life. This world, what we have over here with money, is going to perish. But with Christ, we will have everlasting life. So let's not ever uh, forget that, because, because it's easy to do. All right, I've given you a handout, or hopefully you have one. And if not, I've got, I have extras up here. I'll just let you, if you don't mind, kind of passing those around. So I've got someone passing them around. I have extras right here, too, if you need some. Okay, so this is from page 38 of our book. I really liked this chart. So this should look familiar. But right up here is where, where she's talking about faith, trials, perseverance, and mature, uh, maturity. So this is exactly what James was talking about, particularly last week. But it carries over, and actually, even though we read something from last week, keep in mind, everything builds on to the next one, and so it never really goes away. And I want you to think about, uh, right under here, you, got, you have some blank space, what would be some results? Um, maybe it's joy. Maybe it's obedience. What words would you put here? That when you're living up here, even in those trials, but you're clinging on to faith, and you build that maturity, what's the result of that? So think about some words that come to mind. Um, peace, yes, absolutely. We have obedience. We have trust. We have hope. We have God's blessings. We have empathy and compassion. That empathy and compassion is important to have. Um, we have forgiveness and love, fruit of the spirits, fruit of the spirit. Uh, there's so much that we could write there. So I just want you to think about that. And the reason I want you to, at some point to write something there is because we don't always stay there, do we? And we need some reminders. But we need to remember that even in trials, God is good. And I, yes, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. And let me just take a pause on that, just to make sure we're understanding what good means. When we're talking about God is good, we're talking God is holy. See, our culture, and unfortunately, I've, unfortunately Christians have joined culture in this one, is that we've taken godliness, and we've taken good, as in God's holiness, we've taken the word good to mean nothing more than minimum standard. That is not biblical, and that is not what we're talking about. And it breaks my heart when I have Christian parents come into my office and we're you know, addressing ways to help the teenager or child. And this is what I hear nine out of ten times, and it doesn't matter if they're Christian or not, because they all say it. But my child is good. No, sweetheart, your child is not. Good is nothing more than minimum standard, because that's what they're referring to. And that's what breaks my heart is we've reduced this to nothing more than minimum standard. That's not biblical, because we are called to be godly. 
And when we are talking about good, we are talking about God's holiness. Now, notice I did not say the word perfect. I'm not talking perfection. There's only one who's perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. And if we were perfect, we wouldn't need him, and oh, we need him. So this is not about being perfect, and I'm saying that because I know we'll have some type A's in this room. Not me, of course. Um, <laughs> um, that we, we kind of fall over to this perfectionist side. I'm not talking that. But we, being good is about our behavior that is emulating Christ's likeness. Good is not this minimum standard of, oh, I'm making straight A's. Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, that. No, we're not earning. We can't earn our way into heaven. But I never hear parents talk about my child is good because my child is working on being godly. I have yet in 15 years have a Christian parent come to me and speak that language. Now, I am not here to judge that. I am here to say that breaks my heart that I need to do a better job, or maybe as a church we need to do a better job, of what does that mean to disciple and to mentor and to be able to say even in our godliness we're going to fail, and what do we do with that? So this is not a judgment call. This is a way we need to take a, we need to take a time out and reevaluate the language we are using. And I'm just saying I've seen it time and time and time again. I know parents have good intentions when they say my child is good, but they've done nothing but reduce that to a minimum standard. And that's not what we're called to be. And we live at a higher standard through the grace of God and through his power, not by our own power. Because we can't live up here on our own. Because we will fail miserably. But through his power, we can do the best that we possibly can to emulate God's likeness, to be Christ-like. And again, this is not about perfection. And I will get off my soapbox because I need to watch the time. And it's 729 already. I'm not even done. <laughs> I'm not even close. Okay. So if you don't mind, let me fast forward quite a bit. And I'll get you out of here by 730 or 1, 731. Let me just end with this. So we go into temptation. And some of you, when you look at this list right here. There's two things I want you to do. On the top one, God sustains. On the bottom one, I want you to write, oh, I want you to write God delivers. Because if you are down here, which we have all been down here at some point or another, where we're caught into that trap of temptation, I want you to leave here knowing if you are down here, you do not have to stay here. And I need you to know that we serve a God who, yes, he is our sustainer, he is sovereign, but he is also a God who knows suffering. He knows immense pain, he knows immense sorrow, and guess what? His story did not end there. So if you are down here, your story doesn't have to end here either. He can bring healing. He is a God who delivers us from down here to move back up here. So I'm sorry that I completely ran out of time and I had all these wonderful things to say, but I need to make it clear to you. If you are living in a place not just of, of sin when we talk about our, our sinful desires, I'm talking about if you're living in shame and guilt. Are you holding on to past hurts? Do you think that you are unlovable? Do you think you are unworthy? Can you not forgive yourself? And if you think that you're unlovable and unworthy and unforgivable, then you're going to think that God sees you that way. And I'm here to tell you, no, he doesn't. He longs for you to come into fellowship with him. If you do not know the Jesus I am talking about, then please come see me or see your, your group leader or your friend, and we will gladly share with you the Jesus who will deliver us, who has a plan for you, who does not want to see you in bondage. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is a joy. It is a joy to be here with, with sisters in Christ, to come before your throne with all of our worries, with our insecurities, with our trials, and even our temptations. And Lord, forgive us when we get sucked 
down that vortex of our usual routine of busyness and hurriedness. When we think that we have to earn our way to you, or we have to earn our way into heaven, when we get caught up into the lies of we've got to do it a certain way instead of just trusting you through the process. Forgive us when our battle cry is, my will be done rather than your will be done. And it's so easy sometimes to get caught and be stubborn and want to do it our way when we need to release that and give it to you because your ways are better than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So help us to trust you that you will get us through these trials or when we fall into temptation, that you will deliver us from it, that we will come before you with forgiveness. For the sisters who are in bondage with that shame and the guilt, please release them because that's not of you. May they know your freedom and to walk in your freedom. And Lord Jesus, we do come before your throne with a heart of gratitude, with a heart of humility, trusting you in our day-to-day -day life and trusting that you will continue great work in us and through us for your glory. In your holy name we pray, amen.